and beneficial method of reducing traffic in the park. The general management plan stipulates that the park management should strive for the eventual removal of all vehicular traffic from Yosemite. Current adoption of the Valley Implementation Plan has been delayed to fall of 1997 and is contingent upon further negotiations with surrounding communities and funding. By the early 1970s, theft, fights, drugs, and rapes occurred in the Valley, culmination in a 4th of July riot in 1970. Moreover, automobile traffic has intensified in conjunction with the increase in tourism and has taken a significant environmental toll. Air pollution, especially during these busy summer months, has often produced dense smog in the valley, damaging the multifarious plants and animals which reside in the park. Noise pollution from vehicles and campsite rivals the park's no na natural noises. Buildings, roads, and parking lots have ma mirrored the aesthetic beauty of the valley while visitors are often stuck in traffic hoping to find a parking spot. The general management plan proposes the eventual eventuality that all private vehicles are banned from the park and non-essential roads and buildings will be, re be relocated outside of the park. It is compromised of the visitor use park operation and development plan for Yosemite National Park, the Natural Resources Management Plan, and the Cultural Resource Management Plan. The VIP can, can, can be considered the working copy of the GMP and will work to improve valley access and circulation remove unnecessary roads and buildings, and reclaim priceless beauty while enhancing visitor enjoyment. Its release has been delayed again until fall of 97 as a result of scarce resources and major flooding and subsequent damage to the park. The issue of vehicular traffic deemed one of the most important issues facing the valley today has been addressed in the Alternative Transportation Modes Feasibility Study released in 1995. It presents two options for intercepting day use traffic, which is thought to be growing due to the increased number of visitors living in close enough proximity to visit the park for that day. The first option is to create a system of staging area outside the park, which would intercept day use traffic and transfer this traffic via shuttle to a circulatory system inside the park. The second option calls for a single staging area located within the park to intercept traffic from which visitors would transfer to the aforementioned circulate, circulator system. Of the two options, the National Park Service selected the second as being the most desirable, cost effective, and environmentally sustainable. An issue raised by the Association of National Park Rangers more than 10 years ago Limiting staffing is crippling the parks across the system. Science suffers at Mount Rainier National Park in Washington, where the Park Service does not have the staff or money to monitor several endangered species. Priceless museums collections are piled up in offices at Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument in Montana and boxed up and stored in a basement at Acadia National Park in Maine. School groups are turned away from the various parks, including Yellowstone and some parks are so understaffed that a lottery system decides when children will hear the stories of the parks, our, na our nation's living classrooms. Despite the limited resources available, the employees of the Park Service, from rangers to maintenance workers, continue to be personally committed to protecting our heritage, doing their job, doing the best job possible. For many who work in America's national parks, it is more than a job, it is a calling. Vice President Dick Cheney recognized the value in 2001 when he noted people expect rangers to know just about everything, and they usually do. The typical park ranger works as a historian, resource manager, law enforcement officer, curator, teacher, and sometimes paramedic and rescuer. Yet despite the best efforts of dedicated park staff, the pu public can now feel and see the effects of underfunding and insufficient staffing. There simply are not enough of them to meet the significant evolving challenges facing our national parks. The Park Service is facing a critical shortage of field personnel, a shortage that has grown over the past few years and is likely to worsen. Like the well-publicized backlog of park maintenance projects, it becomes overwhelming. The National Park Conservation Association recommends several actions to immediately address dire staffing needs in the national parks. These include 
Congress and the administration must increase annual funding by at least $600 million. Congress and the administration